Christ the Lord is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Wasn't the music just a gift? That was United Methodists from all around the world that are singing uh, it, through the amazing technology that we have these days. We give God thanks and praise that uh, we are discovering new ways to be creative and to share the old, old story in new ways. Welcome to our worship service today. We're glad that you're here. Today is a special opportunity. We will be welcoming the bishop of our uh, conference, Bishop uh, Reuben Sines. He will be preaching for us today. You'll have the opportunity to hear his words of Easter peace, and for that we are really grateful. Thank you, Bishop, for uh, sharing with us your word of hope in this season. Today we come and we worship God in this season of Easter, and we give God thanks and praise as we come together to worship in our homes and gather together in this way. Let us pray. God, who danced in the morning with the stars, playing leapfrog with lambs in the meadows and swimming with dolphins in the seas, be with us this day, taking us by the hand and teaching us to skip down the streets once more. Jesus, who called into life the butterflies and taught the birds their very first songs, who whispered the clouds to drift across the skies and sang love songs to turtles and giraffes, Chalk that familiar shape on the sidewalks so we can play hopscotch this day. Spirit who breathed life into caterpillars, who is the mist that moves across ponds in early mornings, who is the warm breeze that stirs the curtains and the chill wind that pushes us as we snowshoe in winter, fill us with deep lungfuls of grace that we can share with the world. God, Jesus, Spirit, life, grace, hope, wonder, justice, peace. Be with us this day, we pray. Alleluia. Amen. And now I invite you to listen as our praise band sings Alleluia.
grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. May his peace be with you in all times and in all places and in all ways. I'm Bishop Reuben Sines Jr. and I had the great joy of sharing the message about Christ's resurrection peace on the second Sunday after Easter. The Gospel of John mentions four resurrection appearances of Jesus to his disciples. The first one was read last Sunday when we heard about Mary Magdalene's encounter with Jesus in the garden next to the tomb. There, Jesus calls Mary by name, Mary recognizes Jesus, and then Jesus sends her back to the disciples with the good news that he was risen and that he was ascending to God his Father and the disciples' Father. The Gospel for this morning is found in John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31, and it reads as follows. So this is the second and the third appearance of Jesus to his disciples. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And so now the third appearance of Jesus to his disciples happened a week later. But when Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand on his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him and said, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet come to believe. May the Holy Spirit add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the doing of the word today. Let us pray. Lord, at, at this day, at this time, many of our hearts are searching for the peace that you give, for the peace that passes all understanding. We pray that your peace would visit us this morning and that it would be as real for us today as it was to, his disciple, to your disciples back then when you first appeared to them after the resurrection. In your name I pray, amen. So I have what, what, are, what are known as meditation and mindfulness apps. You, you may be familiar with them. A meditation or mindfulness app is, is an application that leads you through either guided or unguided um, processes to help you center yourself, to help you breathe, to help you become present in the moment, um, to help you take a pause from, from your life when you're feeling stressful or when you have the need for uh, tranquility. And so I use these at various times, and, and they're helpful to an extent. And some of the mindfulness apps promise to uh, help you make friends or kick a habit, uh, sleep better. Uh, some of them are even used to help people lose weight uh, or to help people become more productive uh, at their work. And so they have all kinds of applications, and they're growing in popularity. In 2019, the mindfulness apps gross $198 million dollars. And that's up 52% over 2018. So obviously, there's a real hunger in people's lives for, for peace and calm and tranquility amid all of the stressors that they have to live with. And so, um, but, but that type of mindfulness that, that we can attain in those moments uh, is normally fleeting. <laughs> because we have to continue to do it time and time and time and time and time again. In fact, I even have a breathing app on my watch. And I've, I've noticed that it, it'll signal me whether or not I need to breathe 
uh, at, at different moments, like when I'm in a meeting or an annual conference or, or any time that it detects that there's a change in my heart rate. My, heart, my normal resting heart rate is about 38 beats a minute. But when it gets elevated, suddenly it'll, it'll vibrate on my wrist and it'll, it'll ask me, do you want to breathe now? Uh, and sometimes, you know, I, in the middle of a meeting, I'll, I'll click yes and then I'll start breathing while everything else is going on. But, but it, 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 the, the pulse expands and helps you breathe in air and then it, it, uh, it relaxes and you breathe out and you can set it for a minute or two minutes or five or ten or whatever. I normally don't go for more than a minute, but that helps me uh, center and come back. Um, but that's not the kind of, of, of tranquility and peace that Jesus Christ offers. So in the first appearance in the gospel, Jesus uh, finds his disciples on, on the night of his resurrection. Mary Magdalene met Jesus in the morning. And then at night, the disciples are uh, behind closed doors because they're afraid that they're going to meet the same destiny that Jesus met. And so, and so, and so they're there. Uh, they're, they're very frightened. Uh, the, the scripture says that, they're, they, that they, have, they have a phobos, a fear of what's going to happen to them. And then Jesus, out of nowhere, comes and stands in the middle of them and, and gives them his peace twice. Not once, but twice. My, and so the peace that, that, that they receive is not something that they generate on their own. It is something that Jesus gives to them. I give you my peace. Twice he said that. And so as the disciples are gathered around Jesus and Jesus is standing in the middle of them, uh, they, they receive their peace, and then Jesus breathes on them the Holy Spirit and sends them out into mission. Now, during that time, Thomas is not there. Poor Thomas. He, he missed it. Uh, so when he comes back, everybody tells him, hey, Thomas, guess what? Uh, Jesus came, and he stood in our midst, and this is what happened. And Thomas, you know, he just doesn't, doesn't believe it. Uh, because Thomas wants the same, to see the same evidence that the disciples saw. We always see Thomas and, and say, you know, he was a doubter. But, you know, Thomas just wanted to see the same evidence that the disciples said, until I see it, I won't believe it. A week later, they're back at the same house for some reason, and they're gathered again, and Jesus appears. And he stands in their midst again. But this time, the, the difference in this second gathering is that while the, in the first gathering, there's a mention of the gospel writer of their fear. The second time they gather, there's no mention of fear. And so, and so obviously, something is changing. Um, the disciples had not really received the good news of Jesus' resurrection from Mary Magdalene because they were not quite ready to be the world changers yet because they were traumatized by the violence of the crucifixion. And so the news of Mary was like, well, that's good news. However, our lives are still in danger and at risk. The second, uh, the third visit, when Jesus appears to them along with Thomas, they're gathered, but there's no mention of fear. So perhaps that's a clue that the disciples are internalizing the kind of peace that, that Jesus has given them. So nevertheless, Jesus comes in and he stands in their midst. And he calls Thomas over. And there's a painting, an Italian painting, uh, about you know, Jesus um, visiting with Thomas. And in the painting, Jesus actually is taking the hand of Thomas and guiding his hand to touch his wounds. It's a beautiful painting. I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, and, and Jesus invites Thomas to touch his wounds because Thomas doesn't want to have some disembodied um, Messiah or Savior to believe in. He, he wants a flesh and blood Messiah to believe in. And so Jesus says, touch me. I, I am still flesh and I am still, uh, I am still blood. And so, and so when Thomas touches him, uh, Thomas does something that the disciples do not do. While the disciples gave praise to God and they rejoiced when they recognized it was Jesus, Thomas goes beyond that. Thomas worships and Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And so, and so here we see um, the, the profoundness of Thomas' revelation of who Jesus was. And when I, when I look at, at, these, at these three 
um, models of faith, Mary Magdalene, the disciples, and Thomas, I think about the three different types of believers in the church, right? First of all, you have the devotees, right? The, 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 the hardcore devotees that no matter what happens, uh, they are going to s stick by Jesus, come thick or, th or thin. Uh, what Jesus says, they believe it and that settles it. And they really don't care uh, what the ramifications are for, for them to be associated with Jesus. They really don't care. Because these are the people that have had an experience of, of Christ's healing grace or liberating power, and they know that their lives have been directly touched and transformed by, by the grace and love of Jesus, and so they really don't care. They're devoted, and it doesn't matter what anybody else says, and, and they will be by Jesus. As a matter of fact, I don't know if Mary Magdalene went out to the grave because she was necessarily in sorrow. I think she might have been the only one who really understood what Jesus meant when he said, on the third day I shall rise again. And Mary's presence there may not have all been about her sorrow, but it may have been about her faith, that she went there expecting that Jesus was going to fulfill what Jesus promised. And so, you know, so, so that's Mary Magdalene, the hardcore devotee. Then, then you have the disciples. Now, these persons are people that have seen Jesus, they've heard about it, they, they've, they've heard his teachings, they've witnessed his signs and wonders, but when the going gets difficult, they're not sure of their grounding, and, and they're kind of hesitant to really put themselves out there, and they, they, they're, they're cautious with how far they, they trust God when things get difficult, you know? And one of the things that happens to, to, to us and I include myself, is that, is that when, when we meet a crisis or a difficult moment, we forget about all that God has walked us through. We forget about all those valleys that Christ, our Good Shepherd, has led us through. And all of a sudden, our, our, our history with God is, is nullified, and it's like God needs to start all over again. <laughs> you know, to, to validate or to justify his love and his faithfulness towards us. So, so there's, no, there's no accumulation of memory or, or confidence that says, you know, the God that was with me back then was with me today, like Daniel, and will be with me tomorrow. It's just like, oh, no, where's God? I've, I'm abandoned, and I'm afraid. And so, and so that's kind of the second model. And then you have the third model, Thomas. Thomas is... Is a, is a skeptic, and it's not that he's trying to be difficult. Thomas is just the kind of person that doesn't expect somebody else's faith beliefs uh, at, at, at face value. He's a, he's a kind of person that wants to examine, and he wants to come to his own conclusions so that when his faith is examined after study and reflection and, and, um, and conversation and time, when it's his, it's his, and it's nobody else's, and he can defend it, and he can stand by it, and he can continue to, to live by it for the rest of his life because, because he, has, he has taken what he has heard, he has taken what, what, he, has, what he has observed, and, and he's, he's prayed about it, he's thought about it, he's wrestled and he's struggled with it, and then he's come to his own determination about who Jesus is for him. And so, for, for if we're really truthful, we are all three at the same time. Sometimes we're we're, we're hardcore devotees. Sometimes you know we're we're cautious when things get difficult or or dicey, and uh, and sometimes we just need to examine beliefs and other things that have just been handed to us and said, just believe that. And so, well, wait a second, Let, let's take some time. And so I can find myself in all three of those, of, of those uh, models, and, and sometimes it's probably a combination of all three, but, but, but the, these, are, these are typical of the type of believers that were part of the church. And here's the thing, that Jesus does not reject a single one of them. Because Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I shall not, whoever the Father sends to me, I shall not drive away. So here Jesus is creating a new kind of community, a new kind of community with all kinds of people that are not necessarily living in the same social or theological zip code. 
You know how we live with people in our own zip codes? You know, we, 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 we find zip codes sometimes to live with, with a certain kind of people. Those zip codes are, are obliterated in, in the new humanity that Jesus Christ is creating uh, through his cross and through his resurrection. And so Jesus then is, is binding them in, in unity with each other. And he's binding them with, with a sense of peace. And this is, this is not a peace like, like we Westerners understand peace. As Westerners, we understand peace as the absence of conflict or war. And so, and so we maintain peace, oftentimes through negotiation or di and diplomacy, but always with the potentiality to exert force or power to subordinate the other. And so although there can be a semblance of peace, it's, it might be peace for one, but not peace for the other who is being suppressed by the power of the other. And so, and so this is not the peace that Jesus Christ is talking about. It's not talking about a peace that comes by force or by the threat of coercion or by the, the threat of war. It's a peace that comes from God. And so, and so Paul talks a lot about and the God of peace be with you and the Christ of peace be with you. So it's a peace that, that brings one in harmony with Jesus. It brings one in harmony with each other. And it is a peace that seeks the well-being of the other and the other's inalienable right for freedom and, and for happiness and also for the, the totality of their humanity. So any, any type of peace that suppresses the humanity of the other or that treats the other as a non-person or as a, as a subordinate person is not the kind of peace that Jesus is offering. And so it's a peace that unites them, although they're different, with himself. And it's a peace that unites them with each other. And so the marks of this community that Jesus is creating, this new humanity that has broken down the dividing walls of hostility, is a mark that is, that is, that is distinguished by the presence of Christ in the middle of the community. Christ is the center of the Christian community as he comes to stand in the center of his disciples on the first week, as he comes to stand at the center of the disciples on the second week, and as he comes to stand at the center of his disciples on the third week. A faith community must be established on the centrality of Jesus Christ in the middle. It is a community that is marked by, by peace, it is a community that's, that's marked by forgiveness of sins. And it is a community that is marked by a relationship with Jesus Christ and a relationship with each other. And so, and so this community then becomes the gospel. It becomes the good news that, that, that invites people into that kind of a community, that invites people that are broken and don't understand what it is to have that kind of peace and invites them into that type of relationship that belongs to the Christ community that he has created through his death and through his resurrection and through the giving of his peace and, and the breath of the Holy Spirit. And so when Jesus Christ sends them out into the world, he sends them out into a world that is hungering and hankering for tranquility and for peace and for a sense of of, uh, of wholeness that only God can provide. And so this is resurrection peace. And it is a peace that understands that, that nothing, not even death, can ever separate or destroy the peace that God has given them and the peace that they have in God. And so therefore, whatsoever happens in the, uh, around their lives, whether it's suffering or or, or or uh, uh, difficulty, or, or even um, um, whatever problems or troubles, Christ promises to be with them and walk with them through that, not to remove it, because Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble, but take courage because I have overcome the world. My peace be with you. 
And so Jesus does not revoke the troubles or the trials of, of the world, but he promises to abide and to be with us when we walk through these moments until we get to the other side. And, and so that, that sense of, of assurance is what Jesus is, is really imparting to his disciples. But it's also a sense of justice in that a disciple can experience injustice or, or unwarranted pain or suffering, but a disciple then understands, like Job does in Job chapter 19, verses 25 to 27, that God is just. And Job, when he's going through his period of suffering, he says to himself, and I think it opens up the possibility of a resurrection. In the Old Testament, that, that, that idea was not yet fully imagined until Jesus Christ uh, resurrected. But it was, it was a formative idea because it, the, the issue was, if I suffer in this life and I die, where's the justice of God? But Job starts to push and penetrate the possibility that there is justice if not found on this side of heaven. It will be found on the other side of heaven because God is just and God will make things right. And so Job says, I know my Goel lives. And he said, I know my Redeemer lives. And even though the skin may fail, in my flesh I shall see God. And so it's this, it's this certainty that, that whatever happens to us in this life is, is not definitive and it's, and it's not going to separate us from that love of God in Christ Jesus for ourselves. And that gives us a, a sense of peace to live in the world with, with freedom and with joy and with utter hope because we are a people of hope. And, and Peter says, we have been born into a living hope. And so that, that is our hope, this second Sunday of, of Easter, in these 50 great days of Easter, when we think about the implications uh, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what it means for our life. Like I said before, many people uh, are searching for that kind of a peace. They, they, they pay good money for it. They will, they will pay for classes to meditate and to find that inner peace. And they're trying to find it from within themselves. And there's a sense in which we have our own agency that we can find that peace from within ourselves. But, but some, that peace is not a permanent peace. It is a fleeting peace. But the peace that Jesus Christ gave his disciples when he said, my peace I give you, that, that is foundational. That that goes down to the core of our being. That goes down to the core of our, and the totality of our existence. And that says that, that Christ has laid the fullness of his claim over all of us, not just individually, but collectively as a community of faith. And so therefore, we have that resurrection peace that the disciples experienced even as in as short as one week, when they moved from a fearful group who was afraid to a group that was gathered, figuring out what it meant to be sent, and without fear, but seeking the power of Christ and his abiding presence to go into the world to proclaim the peace that the prophets of old talked about. The Prince of Peace would come. And when that Prince of Peace comes, there will be a peaceable reign of Christ. And there will be no more wars. And there will be no more, no more hunger. And there will be no, no, more, uh, no more conflict because Christ will reign. And that peace was, was given to the disciples. That, that peace is given to the church. And that is a message that we have to share with the world. And friends... That is a powerful message that our world so desperately needs to hear at this time um, as, with all that's going on around us. As people that have experienced that peace of Christ, Christ breathes on us the Holy Spirit 
and sends us out into the world so that we can tell the world of the possibility that now exists for us to be one with Christ, one with each other, and one in mission and ministry to the whole world until Christ comes again and He reigns with peace and with justice. The peace of Christ is one that holds us together as a community of faith. It holds us together in the love of Jesus, the power of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. That's the peace. That's resurrection peace. May the peace of Christ be with your spirit in all times and in all ways. Bas. Thank you, Bishop Sines. And now as we listen to this music that comes to us as a moment of reflection, to listen to hear what the bishop has had to say and how God might be speaking to us today. This is also a time for us to offer ourselves up to God, either through our financial gifts or through prayers that we offer as well. We have a variety of ways of giving. Uh, Givelify is our, our um, app that we use that is an easy way of giving. Uh, you can also invite your bank to send a check to us or you could just send one to us yourselves. We do continue to do the ministry of this congregation and we give you thanks for helping to make that possible. Let us listen now to the gift of music as we think about the ways that God has offered God's self to us and the ways that we are called to serve. Please remain seated. Be thou my mission, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day I night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Be thou my wisdom, thou my true word, I ever with thee, and thou with me. gifts that you give us. And we also ask that you help us to be mindful of all that we have received. We'd ask that you bless the gifts that we bring this day, our hearts and our lives, as well as the gifts of finance that help us to keep the ministries of this congregation alive and well in this challenging time. Bless us and the bringing of these gifts. Multiply them so that there truly is enough for the tasks which lay ahead. We are your people in this time and place, and we give you thanks and praise for that gift. Walk with us and be with us as we continue to be your people, even in the midst of the challenges of the pandemic that uh, we are living into and through at the moment. Bless us and keep us safe. We pray in the name of Christ, who taught the disciples to pray together saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we give our hearts and ourselves to God, we um, have opportunities to serve. And even in this time of social distancing, there are opportunities to serve. I invite you to pay attention to the news that comes from our Chamber of Commerce. They're offering all kinds of opportunities to be involved, whether it's supporting our, our small local businesses, whether it is serving through the food pantry, or by the gifts that you bring there, um, by helping to deliver meals on wheels, to give blood, to help out a neighbor, or just to call and pray for one another. There are many ways that we can serve. And all of this reminds us that we are a connectional church. I'm sure that by now most of you have read the letter that uh, we have received from the bishop announcing my new appointment, um, that I will be moving to Eustace and Farnham, and the letter that I sent along with it. I want you to know that I have been changed by my time spent here in Gothenburg and uh, with this congregation, and I am really grateful. And over the next few weeks, as we gather either in this way or over the phone or by Zoom, um, I hope to be able to share with you some of the things that uh, I have experienced and that we have experienced together and to have an opportunity to say farewell. Our realities may be that we don't get together in the ways that we are used to, but that will not stop us from continuing to hold one another in love and in care. I thank you for the gift that you have been in my life, and I thank the bishop and cabinet for the surprise that brought me here, and a little sadly for the gift that will take me from you to another place. Um, I'd ask that you continue to pray for me and for the congregation as we go through this time together. And now I would like to invite uh, you to listen as we hear from uh, Matt Sell as he brings a word from the Staff Parish Relations Committee. Thanks, Matt. Good morning. I am here as the chair of our SPRC. As many of you know by now, Jamie, Pastor Jamie has been reassigned to another church. This is always a difficult situation, and we thank Pastor Jamie for her service. On a personal note, I really enjoyed having Jamie sing with us in the praise band. Now, moving forward, I have a letter from Bishop Sines that I will read. Dear friends, the cabinet and I are pleased to announce that Pastor Grace Gichuru will be appointed as your pastor beginning July 1, 2020. This appointment concludes a long process during which the staff parish committee of your church has been consulted along with Pastor Grace. We have prayed asking for God's wisdom about the best available leadership for your church and this is our decision. As with all appointments, this one will be fixed during the annual conference closing session on May 2020. I extend my best wishes and prayers to you all during this transition of pastoral leadership for your congregation. Grace and peace, Bishop Signs. Thank you, Matt. Let us pray. God, we are so grateful that you have loved us into being the people that we are. We pray for your love and blessing to continue flowing over us and through us as we are your people in this time and place. We'd ask that you help us find ways to be your church, even in this time of social isolation and separation. Help us to remember that it is one of the ways that we are practicing our love for one another. As we live in this Easter season, help us to keep our eyes and our hearts open for opportunities to share your love and your grace and your hope with all the world. We know that that's what you called the earliest disciples to be about. Help us to live into the peace that passes all understanding and so be transformed that we might be a symbol and a beacon and a lighthouse for our whole community. We give you thanks and praise for the gift of Jesus Christ, resurrected and calling us to new life. We pray in his name. Amen. 
And now as we celebrate going forth, I invite the praise band to send us out with My Life House. And since this is when you like to dance, to get up off of your chairs and dance your way out. this blessing. As we close our time together, remember, God is always with you, no matter what you face. No matter what trials or hardships come your way, God is right there beside you, raising your very life from death, guiding and directing your path. So acknowledge your fear and your worry, and know that it is as true and as holy as any feeling, including joy and hope and love. Take heart, my friends. This is the heart of the matter, and the people shall gather and say, Alleluia! Amen. Go now, in the peace and the love of Christ. Amen.